This Week in IT, an out-of-band Windows Server Update Services patch has backfired and disabled hot patching on some Windows Server 2025 devices. Find out how you can avoid the problem if you haven't already installed the buggy update. Plus, Windows updates are throwing some Windows 10 and 11 machines into BitLocker recovery. And despite the end of support, Windows 10 is still running on more than 40% of PCs. So what's holding back the migration? Stay tuned for all the latest news. Welcome to This Week in IT, the show where I talk about everything connected to Azure, Windows, and Microsoft 365. I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's show, Chaosoft. Windows updates have been causing a lot of trouble this week. I've got two big stories for you on that. But let's start with the Windows Server Update Services out of band patch that Microsoft issued earlier this month. Now, it was discovered that there was a critical vulnerability in Windows Server Update services that could allow attackers to remotely execute code and essentially hijack a server if they were able to do this. So obviously that's quite a critical thing that needed to be patched very quickly. So out of band essentially means not on patch Tuesday. So it's the second Tuesday or is it the first Tuesday of every month. You get these cumulative updates that bundle all of the security fixes together into one big update, but they come monthly. And Microsoft needed to get this patched outside of that monthly patch inside because of the critical nature of this vulnerability. Now, unfortunately, for organizations that installed that original out-of-band update, it was then discovered that it caused a problem with the hot patching feature in on-premises Windows Server 2025. So when I say on-premises, I mean the, ver the version that you can actually install yourself or in a virtual machine on Azure. Now, hot patching is something that essentially allows organizations to not reboot devices every single time they install one of these monthly cumulative updates. So once a quarter, you have to install what they call a baseline update, and that does require a reboot. But then for the next couple of months, you can get away with installing an update without a reboot. Obviously, that can be very important for organizations that need a lot of uptime on their servers. Now, the problem with this out-of-band update was that Unfortunately, it essentially disabled hot patching on those Windows Server 2025 systems. Now, this is something that has only become generally available this year, if I remember correctly, for on-premises Windows Server. It, it existed, hot patching existed for the Azure version of Windows Server that you could only run in the Azure cloud already for several years. So unfortunately now, organizations that have decided to use this in Windows Server 2025 have potentially been stuck with this problem now that they're going to miss out on these cumulative updates that didn't require them to reboot their devices in November and December. So essentially, if you installed that buggy update, now you're going to have to wait until January 2026 when the next baseline update comes, you reboot your server, and then for February and March, you'll be able to enjoy not having to restart your servers if you're enrolled in the hot patching program for Windows Server 2025. Now, what has Microsoft said and done about this? Well, they issued a warning and some organizations will have paused updating to make sure that they didn't get that buggy out of band patch and to wait for a potential fix or some more guidance for Microsoft. So Microsoft has reissued that update. And if you want to unpause Windows Server updates on your servers now, you will get that new version of the update, which patches the critical vulnerability in Windows Server update services, but does not break hot patching. Unfortunately, if you installed that buggy update, you're going to have to wait now till next year before you get updates that don't require a restart of your servers. So that obviously is not a great start for on-premises support of hot patching for Microsoft. But essentially, that's what happened. And hopefully some lessons will be learned from this mistake. Let me know in the comments below if this has affected you and whether you're finding hot patching something useful and workable for your organization. I'd love to know what you think.
Before I go on to the next story, I'd like to ask you for a quick favour. About 55% of the people who watched last week's video weren't subscribed to the channel. We're now on 13,700 subscribers and I'd really love to bump that up to 13,750 this week. So if you find this kind of content useful, please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit the bell notification to make sure that you don't miss out on the latest uploads. That's not the end of the story, unfortunately, for Windows updates. So some Windows 10 and Windows 11 devices after the cumulative update found themselves rebooting into BitLocker recovery mode. So essentially this requires you to insert your BitLocker key, password, or whatever you want to call it, before Windows will boot into the operating system. If you're in an organization and you're affected by this issue, Microsoft has issued a known issue rollback, which you can apply via group policy to essentially undo this problem with BitLocker. If you're a consumer or you're using man Windows in an unmanaged environment and you're not logging in to Windows with a Microsoft account, then this could potentially be a problem because when you go into BitLocker recovery, if you're not able, if you don't know what your password is uh, and you don't have it connected to uh, a Microsoft account, the device, you essentially won't be able to recover that recovery key and you won't be able to boot in Windows and you could essentially lose all of your data because the drive is encrypted, yeah? You can't just take the drive out and send it somewhere to have it, you know, the data restored. You're going to lose access to all of your data. So if you're a consumer in an unmanaged environment or a small business in an unmanaged environment, it's really important that if you're going to enable BitLocker that you're connected to a Microsoft account, then you have the ability to recover your or BitLocker keys. Obviously, if you're in a managed environment, your IT department should be managing the recovery of BitLocker keys for you on your behalf. That's their problem and not yours. Microsoft is saying that you should verify your BitLocker recovery key backups, make sure that they're working if you're in an organization or even if you're a consumer using a Microsoft account. With Windows 11 24H2 new installs, BitLocker is enabled by default. So it's important that you are making sure that you can recover these keys for BitLocker. Otherwise, you do stand to lose all the data on the drive. So you get all of this extra security, but it comes with some extra responsibilities on your behalf. Microsoft is saying that you should now watch out for an out-of-band patch that will fix this issue. Of course, we've just talked about out-of-band patches. I hope it fixes this issue without creating a whole load of other issues. But it seems that this problem is mainly affecting Intel-based devices that have uh, connected standby. So this is a, um, a standby mode that allows the device to still be in communication with the network, even even when the device is asleep. So it's not affecting devices universally. It does seem to only be affecting particular devices. So hopefully you've managed to escape this problem. We probably all know by now that Windows 10 reached end of support last month. And according to StatCounter, which uh, has this kind of monitoring tracking software on a certain number of PCs by, by you know, not a very big percentage, but a, a statistically meaningful number of PCs to use it as a as a gauge about 40% of PCs still are still running windows 10 so that means that you know that we're not seeing a, a big push to migrate to windows 7 and the analysis of all this seems to be that windows 10 is more sticky than windows 7 was when you were kind of forced to migrate to windows 10 so this is a bit of a problem for microsoft pushing people towards windows 11 so why are people not wanting to move to Windows 11. Well, we're going to get all the comments about it's rubbish, I don't like it, we don't like it, and all the rest of it. Well, okay, there are lots of people who do like it as well. So, you know, that's not necessarily the reason. But there are, of course, factors. So the hardware requirements for Windows 11, you know, people have old hardware, and because of the financial and economic uh, situation across the world now, a lot of uncertainty in the economy, lots of stuff going on. Yeah. <laughs> 
then maybe organizations don't want to renew their hardware to meet those new requirements that are needed for Windows 11. So that can be an issue. Microsoft is also offering the ability to pay for extended security updates for Windows 10. So if you're not going to upgrade your hardware or there's another reason why you don't want to migrate to Windows 11, then, okay, you can pay for another year. I think it's going to be two years maximum to get those extended security updates. There will, of course, be organizations that have mission-critical applications that don't work on Windows 11 for whatever reason, and a lot of work needs to be done. I was reading this morning, I think the Department of Agriculture in the UK has spent millions and millions of pounds upgrading the operating system across their PCs just now to Windows 10, just as it goes out of support, and they've still got a number of devices they still need to upgrade. So that's quite amusing that they're only reaching the end of that migration process just as the operating system is going out of support. Completely crazy, right? Some people think that the requirements for a certain level of hardware was a stunt that Microsoft pulled, essentially to force people to upgrade. Now, of course, that's a very cynical way to look at it, and I completely understand why people might. And I do think it was part of the reason, but it's not the whole reason, because there are a lot of security features in Windows 11. In order for them to run efficiently, they do require certain hardware, a certain level of performance to make them run. So if Microsoft is going to progress with the security improvements in the operating system, at some point you actually have to have hardware, believe it or not, that supports these things in a way that's going to allow the operating system system to run with acceptable performance. And it's just one of those unfortunate things that because Windows is installed on so many PCs around the world, of course, it's a major, major target. And, you know, I'm a little bit tired of hearing, oh, we're going to move to Linux because that's more secure. Every day I'm reading about, you know, vulnerabilities in Linux and all these things as it becomes more widely, well, it's been more widely used in, in the server landscape for many years already. So, you know, it's really about, you know, the gains that you can get from attacking Windows just because it's so widely used, not necessarily because it's inherently worse than Linux in the security grounds. I know that was certainly considered the case, you know, 10 years ago, and maybe it still is. But all these things that Microsoft are doing to try and improve security in Windows 11 has to be a good thing. But of course, it does require modern hardware to get to make use of all that really good stuff that's coming into Windows. Uh, not all of it, though. Things like administration protection, so administrator protection, which, I, which was, I think, made generally available in October's cumulative update, I don't believe has any specific security requirements. So there are some features that are coming along that's disabled by default. You have to enable it, by the way, um, that don't necessarily require upgraded hardware. But that's not the case for all of Windows 11's security features. I think it's going to be a slow progress to Windows 11 or whatever comes after Windows 11 from Windows 10. I think until, until we really start to see organizations forced to do a hardware fresh recycle because the hardware is just getting so old, it's you know no longer effective to try and maintain it, or there's some really, really compelling need to get AI working locally on the device and have that new hardware, like the neural processing units that you find in Copilot Plus PCs, until that becomes a must-have, then I think it's going to be an upward hill battle for newer versions of Windows. If you found the content in this video helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a thumbs up because it helps to get it seen by more people on YouTube. I'd like to leave you with another video now about the Azure service outage that happened last week. So if you're using Azure services in the cloud, do check that out. But that's it from me for this week. I'd like to thank again the sponsors of today's video, Chaosoft, and I'll see you next time.